Uh, the reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 12 through the end of the chapter. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. With the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field, there he fell headlong, His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this. So they called that field, in their language, Akadama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and... May another take the place of leadership, his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who has been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots. And the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. All right. Thank you, Wendell. <clears throat> Those of you who were scared that we were never going to get through Acts can breathe a sigh of relief that we covered a good chunk this time. Um, if I can make it through. So... Um, I was recently being, uh, some of you are aware of the organization that Steve, Steve worked for is named Chrysalis. I, I wasn't aware. Someone just told me that that, I, I don't know if they were talking about what the story is of how that organization came to be, but that word Chrysalis, does anyone know what that is? It's, it's like, yeah. I did not know that. And see, some people just knew that and have known that all along, and I didn't. So, so they told me, and so <coughs> a caterpillar, y- y'all know this from like elementary school biology, but a caterpillar turns into like this cocoon thing, which is called a chrysalis. And then, and then eventually, now someone can correct me, but I think it's like 10 days that it, that it stays in this chrysalis, and then it breaks open and becomes a butterfly. I always thought that was one of the coolest things that God made. Like, how amazing is that? And you have a a caterpillar which looks nothing on the surface like a butterfly, and then when it goes into this chrysalis, it becomes like, the way they describe it is, it becomes like a soup. Like, it turn every, all the parts just sort of mix up together, which is just bizarre, right? And and then it comes out a butterfly. Like it turns into like this soupy who knows what and, it, and then comes together after 10 days and becomes a butterfly. 
And this chrysalis is like an in-between state. It's like you're in between a caterpillar and a butterfly. You're not quite, you're not, you're not the one, you're not the other yet. And when we, when we look at this passage, the disciples, I, I, I think about that butterfly image to understand where the disciples are at. They're in this in-between stage. And I think, you know, if, we, if you read through the book of Acts fast, you might, you might just read about Jesus giving this promise that, that Matt um, preached on last week where he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. And then he says, where they're going to be your, his witnesses. And, and then we think, okay, then, then Acts just goes to um, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. God promises, and, but no, there's this part in between, and we're, we're going to look at the in-between part, but the disciples were in between what God had promised them was going to happen, that they were going to receive power, and, and what, what was actually going to be lived out, what was actually going to be experienced. They were in between when Jesus gave them their mission and when they start living that mission out. When they were launched, Jesus told them to wait. They were in between. Jesus promises that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I don't even know what they must have been thinking that would look like and what the actual experience would be. They were in between what they were and what they were becoming. And if you think about Peter's life, because I think we get the best picture of him, they were in between, like Peter was in between having just denied Jesus three times Think about this. In about 40 days, Peter had just been the guy that had denied Jesus, denied that he knew Jesus three times, was so dejected and broken by it that he went back to fishing. He was done. And Peter is in between that guy and the guy that he is in Acts 2 when he stands up and declares what God, this new thing that God is doing and this new people that God has formed. And he calls 3,000 to be a part of the church. Peter's in between weakness and strength, in between his old self and his new self. And I don't know about you, um, some of you that know the story, I mean, spoiler alert, like in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit's going to come down, it's going to get crazy, and tongues of fire, and Peter's going to be a different person. Spoiler alert. All right, but um, most of you know that. And sometimes, you know, it's easy for us to think that what, what happened? How did Peter go from being that person to this person? What happened in between? How did he, how did he go from being this broken, failing disciple— couldn't get himself together to the guy that stood up and started the church and was a new was a new person the rock that Jesus said he was going to be the rock that Jesus called him and it's easy to think that God just zapped him with the Holy Spirit and he was all of a sudden instantaneously different and I think that would be a mistake mistaken understanding of what happened of the transformation that happened and I think sometimes we wish that would happen. We wish that would happen in our lives, that God would just zap us. Like, can't, I'm, I'm, I'm weak and all I do is ever mess up. And God, you've promised me all these things. You've promised me that you're making me a new person. And why can't I just be what you're making me? And we want God to zap us. Can't you just, can't you just do it? Can't you just, you know, touch me and, and make me different? And I think it would be a mistake to think that Peter, just all of a sudden, when the Holy Spirit came on him, he became a different person. There were some things that happened in the in-between, some ways that he partnered with God, the people of God partnered with God in becoming who God was making them. Let's look back again at Jesus' commission of his disciples. In Acts 1-8, Matt talked about this. This is what Jesus promised. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. The disciples were in between God's promises of who they are. God told them who they are. He promised them who they were, and the experience of becoming that. Do you know that all of us find ourselves in some way in between the promise of what God 
God has promised he's made us, what God has done in us, and the experience of being able to live it out. We're in between God declaring that we're a new creation and actually living as a new creation. We're in between God declaring that we're forgiven and redeemed and experiencing what it is to be cleansed and to walk as a new person. After Jesus made, made these precious promises about who they are and the power that would be given them, notice first what they didn't do as we get into this passage. Notice first what they didn't do. Um, they, they didn't do nothing. And that, that's significant to think about. Like, God just promised them, in a few days, you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus said it, it's going to happen, so why not just put some popcorn on and watch some Netflix? I, I mean, God's going to do it, right? They didn't do that. They didn't put popcorn on and watch Netflix. It's not just because Netflix wasn't available back then. They didn't do it. And you know, you think about this, like what, uh, I, I think we'll get kind of messed up if we, if, we, if we try to think about, you know, did they have to do these things that we're going to read about in order, to, in order for God to do what he was going to do? I think that that's beyond our ability to understand. But they didn't, just, they didn't just sit there. And sometimes, listen, sometimes God makes us promises and he says, this is who you're becoming. This is who I've made you. The reality is, if we, we, we hope to become that, and sometimes it's just a hope, it's just a wish. We don't do anything. We are not going to become who God has told us we will be if, if, if we just watch Netflix and make popcorn. Not, not to pick on Netflix. Disney Channel, same, same effect. We are not going to become who God wants us to be if we just, if we just assume that, well, God said he's going to do it, so I'm just going to hope that somehow it happens. It doesn't work that way. And what we see, you know, many, many Christians read these promises and look at how powerfully God works in Acts, and, and we see all these things, and we know pretty soon we're going to see how these, these promises are for us, too. And we reread these things, and we see these things, and we think, well, you know what? Um, instead of believing that, that God can do it, we sort of start to settle for where we're at. Well, I guess this is just, I guess God's just not doing it with me. Because we hope that it would happen somehow, and we don't know how. And it didn't. So why? why? Why did they not sit? What, why did they do what they did? And what I think, what I think we're going to see as we walk through this is that God doesn't, the disciples were starting to understand that God doesn't work that way. God works through his people. God accomplishes his purpose through us. Even the work that he's doing inside of us, there's a partnership between us and God. And our part is to trust. Our part is to believe. Our part is to have faith. And that involves steps. That involves moving with God. Um, we saw a bit back how God opened their eyes to understand the scriptures. And um, as Jesus said in, in Luke in Luke 24, during those 40 days, he taught him about the kingdom of God, and he opened their eyes. You know, I, I, I took Spanish for four years in high school, and I could speak about this much. Like, I came to this church, and I tried to, I tried to talk to people, and it didn't work out so well. I have a few words out here and there. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, I went down to Mexico for a bit, and I thought, I thought those four years were useless. Man, just, what did, I, what did I learn? I can't even speak. Barely understand a few people every once in a while if they talk slow. And then I went down to Mexico, and I, I, I'm living with a family and doing ministry, and, and you know what? Things start to click. Like, no, wait, I, 
I had this knowledge like in the back of my head and now it's all like it's all working like it I get it now and it's coming out and and I and, and I'm able to speak and it's not that all the stuff I, I I learned was useless but it started to click and see the disciples that's kind of how I picture them they they knew they knew the scriptures well and they'd been taught a whole bunch of stuff but all of a sudden their eyes were opened and things started clicking they realized what was going on and they and they started acting differently the Holy Spirit was already working in them Jesus had breathed on them and given them the Holy Spirit he was helping them to be transformed and this is how they responded and one way or another they realized their part was faith and this is what we're gonna see them working out so Jesus said, you will receive power. In a few days, it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit's going to come on you. Let's look at what they did. And when we do, we're going to see, I, I want us to see how do we wait on God's power to launch us into mission? How do we wait on God's power to become who he's making us? We could put it a whole bunch of different ways. But the first one, the first thing we see them do is they engage in united and persevering prayer. They engage in united and persevering prayer. Um, it says the, the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the, the Mount of Olives, which is really close. It's like maybe a half mile, three quarters of a mile. So they, re, they returned. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the, to the upper room where they were staying. And, and then it tells us who was there, the disciples. Um, we'll get back to that in a second because I want to highlight some things. But, um, but then, uh, then it says, they all join together constantly in prayer. They all join together constantly in prayer. Now, Jesus gave them a promise, and what did they do? They, they went, they, he said to wait for them, wait in Jerusalem for the gift my father promised. They went to Jerusalem, they did what he said, and when they got there, this is what they thought wait meant. It didn't mean make popcorn and, and, and flip open the computer, watch Netflix. It meant, to them, wait meant join, let's join together constantly in prayer. And I want to highlight just a couple things real quick that these words here, the word together is um, really a rip-off word in English of what, what literally means they were of one mind. They joined together of one mind. This is 120 people. 120 people came together and, they, and, and they're joining together of one mind. What was their one mind? It was, God, do what you promised to do. Do what you want to do in us. They were asking him to do what he promised. And they did it of one mind, in unity. Um, it's pretty cool. Luke specifically tells us there were women there. And this is, this is consistent with Luke. But look at, how he, look at how he says this. There's 120 people, but look at what he says. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of, of Jesus, and with his brothers. There's some people that he highlights. In the culture in that day, to say, we all joined together constantly in prayer, and, and we were of one mind, and then he mentions that there were women there, that would not have, that would not have flown culturally. You mean that there, there's, a, there's a partnership of men and women coming together and praying to God? This, this would have been culturally very different from what they're used to, and, and Luke wants, wants to highlight that. The Holy Spirit was going to fall, as Joel said, on men and women. Many commentators think that um, there, there were almost certainly children there because some of these women, we know who they would have been and they, um, from, you know, from the Gospels, but some of the women were probably wives of, of the disciples and they had children and there were almost for sure children there. And the Holy Spirit was about to fall on men, women, and children, 120 of them. And Luke wants us to know that. And he wants us to know that they, they all came together in partnership in one accord. 
Okay, the other thing I want to highlight is this word constantly. They all join together constantly in prayer. And constantly doesn't so much mean they never stopped praying. The word there is, it, it more reflects this idea of persistent prayer. They came together persistently in prayer until they prevailed. They came together persistently. The old saints would have called this prevailing prayer. They would have said it like that. They came together until their prayer was effective and, and, and overcame. They kept asking. That's what that idea is. They came together constantly. So it was, a, it was serious prayer. It was united prayer. It was a determination to come to God until he did what he had promised. And so I wonder if... What, I wonder if you've ever asked this question, why do we have to pray in order to receive what God's promised? If God promised us something, why should we ask him for it? Why do we need to pray? Does he, does he promise us something that he's reluctant to give us? Martin Luther said, the answer to that is a big no. He said, he said prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance but laying hold of his willingness. He's more than willing. Why is it that we, he wants us to pray? Why is it that that's the way of the kingdom? Is asking. Because God, in, in the beginning, when he created us, he created us to rule. He created us in his image to be representatives of him on earth. And he created us to carry out his purpose. And God was going to work his purpose through people. And he's still determined to do that. We, we're asking God because he wants to partner with us. He wants to work his purpose through us. He's more than willing and he wants us to come to him and lay hold of his willingness. So why, why do we pray? We pray because prayer is the language of faith, because faith is our part in this partnership. How do we, how do we have faith? It's all about prayer. It's all about coming to God and asking. You know what? Pray prayers are a way of fleshing out our faith. I don't know if you've ever had this experience before. But see, we know in our head. We know in our head that God's forgiven us. But we feel in our hearts like we're messed up. Has anyone else ever felt that before? I know in my head that I'm clean. God has cleansed me. But I feel in my heart that I'm still dirty. And see, I had that, I had that experience. I, I had failed in something um, just, just recently in my head. I knew God, God forgives me. Um, not only forgives my failure, there's grace for it. Plenty of grace for it. But in my heart, it still condemned me. And see, sometimes we got F's on our report card. And we, got, and we come to God with it. But when I start to pray and I get on my knees and I say, God, I, I, know I, I know I failed and I still feel this way. Pretty soon as I come to him in the action of coming to him, I don't know what happens in that in-between time, but sometime before, between when I get on my knees and I start praying and I cry out to him and, and, and somehow when I'm done, I know that I, in my heart that I'm cleansed. I'm not condemned anymore. It's the way I work out my faith. And that's what the disciples were doing. They come together and they pray. Did God pour out his spirit the way he did in Acts 2 because his people prayed? Um, we, we don't want to say more than what the scripture says, but as many commentators have noticed, all the way through Luke and Acts, prayer 
prayer came before big moves of God. Prayer came before big decisions. And we see that over and over again. And when we see that pattern, we ought to take note of it. Um, there's a, a guy named J. Edwin Orr who wrote a whole lot about revivals, did a lot of study on revivals, and this is what he said. No great spiritual awakening has begun anywhere in the world apart from united prayer. Christians per persistently praying for revival. If we want our hearts revived, if we want to love God with all our hearts, we want to be the people that God's created us to be, we want to move from where we are to where he's, he's truly made us, who he's made us to be, it's going to take prayer. Okay, so the first thing we see in that in-between time that the disciples do is that they pray. The second thing, they trust that God is working out his sovereign purposes through trials and suffering. They trust that God is working out his sovereign purposes through trials and suffering. I, I think I've mentioned this before, but I began to pray while I was on sabbatical, and I've continued to pray this way um, kind of morning after morning. Um, I've just prayed that God do whatever you need to do in me. Do it. Whatever you need to do to get me ready for your work, whatever you need to do in me to make me, make me ready for the purposes that you have for me, do it. And, and, then, and then I really try to look for and see what, what, God's, what God's bringing to me, what God's doing in the midst of it. And I realize, I, I mean, I can go back to the beginning of my sabbatical, I could recount so many different things, but I realize that God's been doing it. And guess what? Sometimes it's super painful stuff. Super painful stuff happens. And instead of I, the, Lord's, the Lord's working on my heart, because when super painful stuff happens, guess what? Usually what my, what my flesh wants to do is say, you messed up again. You're never going to get it right. And I, I could spiral into this into this place of just unbelief, letting go of faith. And instead, God's been, God's been showing me that, that a key is to realize when painful stuff happens, when suffering comes, when difficulties come, tr God wants us to trust that he is working out his purposes, whatever it is. If it's internal stuff, if it's external stuff, God wants us to trust him in the midst of it. And we see that with the disciples here. What happens after, after they pray, it says um, Peter stood up among them. And uh, this is just a side note, but like you can see a difference between their meetings and most of our meetings. And this is a condemnation on all of us, probably especially me. We come together and we pray at the beginning and we pray at the end and we have a long meeting and try to get some things done. They came together to pray and God said, hey, there's an item that I want you to get done. And so here they're praying, they're in the midst of praying and Peter, they realize, you know, there's some things they saw in scripture and they realize that there's some stuff that they need to do. And Peter stands up and he says, hey, you know, y'all know what happened to Judas. And we're going to get into this in a minute, but Luke goes into a whole lot of detail about what happened to Judas, the judgment that was poured out on him. And I think there's reasons for it. And he goes into a lengthy discussion of what the disciples did and the need to appoint someone else, the need to appoint someone else. And there's reasons, I, I think there's reasons. I one of the big questions that I ask myself as I work through this passage is, why does Luke give so much airtime to this? Like, man, he's just, he's going boom, boom with, with what's happened and the, 
The narrative has just started in this story and, and the best part is coming up in, in chapter 2. And why, why is he giving so much airtime to this decision and how they went about um, replacing Judas? And I, I, think, I think the reason is this. I think it's because the disciples and us and for Luke's purposes, Theophilus needed to know that God was going to continue to work out his plan of salvation through trials and suffering. He needed them to know that this wasn't a mistake. What happened to Judas wasn't a mistake. God was still working out his purposes. It's going to continue. His purposes are going to continue to be worked out through trials and and suffering. Um, in this case, with, with Judas, uh, the disciples, and Luke tells us, and the disciples realized this was written about a long time ago. God knew this was going to happen. But you could imagine the condemnation that, that might have come from other folks. If, if Jesus came, Jesus knew everything and was a, was a prophet why would he why would he have chosen this guy judas when he was going to do he was going to become so wicked and do such a wicked thing the disciples themselves realize uh, you know we realize that uh judas betrayed jesus and how how hard that is I think this is the first time I really thought about how hard this must have been for the disciples. Judas betrayed Jesus, but Judas betrayed all of them. They were family with each other. Jesus said, these are my brothers. The disciples saw each other as brothers. Judas, when he betrayed Jesus, he betrayed all of them. And not only that, think about this. The disciples didn't understand what was going on. They, even though Jesus had told them about his crucifixion, that he was going to have to die, they watched Judas hand Jesus over, and then they watched him be crucified. When you go through loss, when you go through tragedy, when you go through difficulty, some of you that have gone through suffering, it sears something. It hurts, and it hurts deep. And how many of them were looking at Judas and saying, this happened because of Judas? Judas? I can't believe what he did. And see, the disciples, what they're doing here is they're internalizing a lesson. They're realizing this had to happen. This had to happen. Jesus knew about it. God knew about it in advance. It had been written about. It had to happen. It was a part of how God was going to accomplish his purposes. And in that way, I believe, I believe some, some healing happened for the disciples. But the reality is, for us, there's pain for us when we watch people walk away from Christ. There's pain when we lose people. There's pain when people leave our lives. There's, there's pain that we're going to walk through. Paul, in his last letter that he's writing to Timothy, he writes about pain of abandonment. He says, everybody abandoned me. But the Lord stood with me. He, he, he talks about people that, that did him harm to Timothy. It, it's, it's hard. It's hard to follow the Lord. We're going to have people that do us harm. We're going to have people that cause suffering. And the disciples needed to know that and understand it. Man, you get to, I'm, I'm really jumping the gun here, but you get to Acts 16, one of my favorite chapters in Acts for a lot of different reasons. But you see, you see this scene, and I think this is, this is what it looks like to internalize this lesson. Paul had realized that God is accomplishing his purposes through suffering. It's going to require some suffering on my part. And, and so he goes through this long 
drawn out process of trying to figure out where God's taking him next and seeking direction and God closes this door and the spirit prevents him from going here and there and then all of a sudden he gets clarity and God makes it clear that you're to go to Macedonia. How many of you have ever been certain that God said, here's what I'm, where I'm sending you? And then you get there and all kinds of messed up things happen. And you, you think, well, I must have messed up. I must have been wrong. No, Paul was right. And Paul realized that. But he gets to Macedonia and then right away he gets thrown in prison. And the scripture says about midnight, which is a, a symbol of just how dark that must have been. Like, why did you allow this, God? And about midnight, it says Paul was there singing and worshiping. Why? Because Paul had learned that God works out his purposes through suffering. Crazy things are going to happen. And the disciples needed to know that. We need to know that. We need to know, you need to know, that the pain that you've suffered, things that are still hurting you, some of those things had to happen. God is still working out his purpose through you. He still will. Last, actively, uh, so this is the last way that we see the disciples waiting and what, they, what we see them doing, waiting as they're becoming this, this missional people. They actively seek to understand who they are in Christ. We actively seek to understand who we are in Christ. This is perhaps the, um, a summary of what was going on in this chapter. But it's crazy to think about, if, you, if we go back to the prayer part, the word for prayer, when it says they united constantly in prayer, the word for prayer is the prayers. And it's, it was probably fairly liturgical what they did. In fact, you can, see, you can see a little bit of a picture of how they prayed. They probably used a lot of the Psalms. They probably pr pray, prayed a lot of the Psalms in unison with each other. If you look at Acts 4, you see the people praying. We're not going to go there right now, but I'm going I'm to read you a quote from, from Psalms. They, they read this, this Psalm, and, it's, and, and, and they say, You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. They read these verses, and then they apply them. They say, that's what's happened. That's the story we're in the middle of. And they start praying for boldness. What's going on in this chapter, what we see is that the disciples are, they're praying, but they're, they're, they're looking at the scriptures. They're understanding who they are. They find themselves in this story. They realize what has gone on with Judas, and they apply and they apply it to who, who they are and what God is doing. They're understanding what God, what God the story that God has in that, them in and how he's working it out. Um, Alistair McIntyre said this, and I think, it's, I think this is such a, such a powerful quotation. I can only answer the question, what am I to do? If I answer the prior question of, of what story do I find myself a part? The disciples would only know what they were supposed to do if they, could, if they could tell what story they were a part. And a summary, I think, of what they were doing is they were, they were trying to understand what story they were a part of, who they are in Christ, who God has made them, who, who God is making them as a new people. One of the reasons why we find it so difficult, I think, to, to see God's power working in our lives is that we, we don't know who we are. We don't know where we stand in God's story. And see, if we, if we see ourselves, and I don't mean up here, I think we've got the truth. We believe that, we believe that Jesus died for us. We believe, we believe these these truths that are, that are the big 
big pieces in the story, but it's hard for us to live out of. And see, the reality is that if, if most of us are living a lot like our neighbors and, and we see ourselves as a doctor or a lawyer or a car salesman that has, that, that has Jesus in our lives, almost like an accessory, we're not going to see his power working in us. Because that's, that's not the reality. That's not the truth. That's not what God's done in us. The reality is he's made us a new creation. He's made us a new person. The, the reality is that, that you are a new creation. You are forgiven. You are set apart for him. You are his. And, and everything else about your identity, you are, you are God's child. You are his representative. Everything else about your identity is an accessory. And we've got to see ourselves in that. We've got to see ourselves that way right here in our hearts from where we live from, not just from, from what we know. Um, look at what, and we're going we're gonna to close with this, but look at what it, it says in Ephesians chapter 1. Now, before we get to this point, Paul goes in, Paul has a huge run-on sentence where he is just, he's overflowing, describing what, God has done for us and who he has made us. He tells us he has, he has poured out every spiritual blessing on us. This is what God has done for us. He has chosen us before the beginning of time to be holy and blameless in his sight. In, in love, he predestined us to be adopted as his child through Christ Jesus to the praise of his glorious grace. And Paul's just, he's bubbling over what Christ has done for us. He's redeemed us. He's forgiven us. That's all what's true of us. That's who we are. And then look at how he prays. After that, he prays, we're going to see this, that the eyes of their hearts, these are believers, the eyes of their hearts would be opened. And in essence, what he's saying is, these are things that I know you believe, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you about who you are, but I'm praying that the eyes of your hearts would be open so that you will know the implication of what that means. So you will go from that in-between of where you were to where you can live out of these things. Here's what he says. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. When we look at this in-between place where we are, in this place where we know we, we believe, we believe what God has promised us, we believe what he's done, we believe what he's accomplished, but we're not, we're, when we're honest with ourselves, we, we want to see more of the power that raised Jesus from the dead working in us working through us. We're in between that. What Paul says is needed, that the eyes of our hearts would be opened, that we would understand. And that comes through, that comes through praying. It comes through coming to God in prayer. Open the eyes of my heart. That comes through opening up God's word and saying, help me to understand. Help me to get this. Help me to know who I am. Help me to know what you've created me for. Do you realize it says you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he planned in advance. He knows what he created you for. And all the power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you to completely transform your life. He's not holding back. He's not withholding. He's not reluctant 
He's waiting for us to say, yes, I believe you'll do it. I believe you can do it. That's the faith part. We come to him and we say, we say Lord, do it. I believe that you can. I believe that you will. I believe that you promise that I'm going to keep coming. I'm going to keep coming until you do it. I believe that we're, we're a small church, but I believe that you have purposes for us. And I want to keep coming and keep coming until you accomplish those, until you make us what you, you've created us to be. Because we believe you can glorify yourself in amazing ways when your people surrender to you. Do we believe this morning that God, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, is, is here and is available to us to make us the missional people that God wants us to be? That he, he turned the world upside down through this 120? But God is not, he doesn't show favoritism. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's willing to do it through us. Are we willing to, are we willing to believe that? Are we willing, when we're in this in-between place, are we willing to pray? Are we willing to keep coming until he answers? Are we willing to ask him to open our eyes until our eyes are open, until we understand? Are we willing to keep coming even though there's going to be pain and suffering and people, might, people are going to hurt us and leave us? Are we going to see those things and realize that some of those things maybe had to happen? But God is still accomplishing his purpose. He's still able to. I'm going to close. Just a, you know, I, I went through... Um, one sec. I share this not from a place of strength, but from a place of weakness. Um, I went through I went through some real hard things this this past week. Um, I don't have like what I would consider like intense anxiety or panic attack or whatever you might want to call it very often at all, uh, but I. Man, for more than a day, I couldn't get rid of s something. And it was, it was just, it was spiritual battle. It was accusations. It was, it was hard. I was weak. I was hurt. I reached out to all kinds of people to pray for me. And couldn't sleep for, I had my eyes open a whole night. I just couldn't, couldn't turn it off. And, and that was, you know, my, my prayer had been and is and was, God, do what you need to do in me. And that was the last thing I wanted. Uh, that was the last thing I wanted to walk through. But then um, somehow God got me to this, a, a place of just, such such weakness i cried out and he started he started meeting me i felt his felt his power really working in me i felt a grace to pray and just to keep praying like i, I hadn't felt in a long time and i i say that because you know i'm, I'm not coming from a place of strength when i come to to say these things but I'm coming from a place of, I believe that God wants to do a work in us. If we'll trust him, we'll believe it. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, it's always fun when I get to close out for Scott. Now, Scott, let me tell you all my notes. No. <laughs> you guys know my dad's a pastor. When we first got married, but Scott would always be like, please don't tell me what Pastor Eddie would think about what I said. I don't want to know what your dad would have said to what I just said. Um, I just thought we could pray th real simple. Let's just pray through Ephesians 2. That was an awesome prayer. If we can pull it back up, that'd be awesome. But I'm just going to read it out from here. Here it is, Ephesians 1. All right. Just going to pray it over us as a blessing. 
So Lord, the God of our Father, our God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may you give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation today, Lord, in the knowledge of you, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened, that we, Lord, may know what is the hope of glory to which you have called us, what are the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints? And Lord, would you show us what is the immeasurable greatness of your power towards us who believe, according to the working of your great might that you worked in Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly place, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And thank you, Lord, that you have put all things under his feet, Jesus' feet, and you have given Jesus as the head over all things to the church, and we are your body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And God's church said, amen. Have an awesome, blessed Sunday, everyone. Enjoy.